you join me today at the wheel of a very nice Mercedes, an E-Class before they were E-Classes. Yes, today I'm driving a W124, and it's rather nice. If there was ever going to be a top 10 of the greatest Mercedes ever built, the battle for the top spot would come down to a fist fight between the W123, potentially the greatest car ever built, and this, the W124, which came after it, which built on the success of the W123 and then took it a bit further into the future. So, what have we got here today? This is a W124, a 260E, if you will. Now you may be thinking, this is an E-Class, not a 260E. Well, it was in 1993, but this is a 1992 car, so it's not an E-Class yet. Well, the W124 was sold from 1984 to 1997, apart from in America, where it was sold from 1985 as the 86 model year until 1995. But that's America. Now, in certain parts of the car, more on the inside than the outside, you can see how it has evolved from the W123, but in other areas, it's very much a car of the 80s, even though design work started way back in 1976. Now, those initial concepts back in 76 were done under Hans Scharenberg, just a concept idea of what to replace the W123 with. But in 1977, when the uh, project officially started, it was taken over by Werner Breitschert. I don't know why I try and say these names. I don't know why I do it to myself. But the design was officially signed off by 1981, and it was an internal, not competition exactly, but various proposals were put forward, and the one that was selected that you see here was from Bruno Saka. You know, a design god, basically. Following that exterior sign-off, internal development work and prototyping was finished by 1984, ready to go on the market. Now, looking at the styling of the car, it's very much a child of the early 80s. All the styling cues are very much there for the new decade. These wraparound headlights with semi-integrated uh, indicators in the side, the wraparound bumpers, which are more integrated into the body, the air dam, which is more prominent. These are all things that are very much developing and growing, improving the car's well, modern integrated look and aerodynamics. In fact, the 2-litre diesel with its narrower tyres had the best uh, drag coefficient, a 0.28 CD, which the lowest in the world at the time. And looking down the side of the car, look at this on the flanks here. We've got lower body mouldings in a dark grey colour. This is possibly the most 1980s executive uh, design trope going. Uh, there's so many other cars that sort have of followed on with this trend and it was a big thing, made cars look very kind of cool and classy and hit the rust really well until it was far too late. You know, it's hard to say whether Mercedes influenced the world or the world influenced Mercedes, but I'm going to go with the former because carry on from the W123, we've got these ribbed tail lights, which Mercedes said kept the lights cleaner for longer in uh, dirty driving conditions because the dirt would uh, not sit in, I don't know, one of these faces somewhere and it would, be stay, it would stay clearer and brighter. This was a kind of styling design idea that was copied on a lot of other cars, but it really emanated from Mercedes, as far as I know. Of course, being a Mercedes, we've got this little tag which pops through the grill when you pull the bonnet release. So you don't have to get your hands dirty reaching inside the engine bay. How common is that? This is an inline six non-turbo, normally aspirated petrol engine. And there were a lot of engine options on these cars. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Everything from a two litre diesel to a six litre V8. If I listed everyone, we'd be here forever. So this in the 260 is a 2.3 litre M103 litre engine. Now, there's a lot of different output variations as well on these cars. So this could either be 158 or 168 horsepower and either 220 or 230 newton metres of torque. Give it an order 60 time, of either eight and a half or nine seconds. So there's not really a lot in it, but there's so many variations without knowing a bit more detail about the specific car, which I haven't been able to find this morning. I can't really tell you. What I can say though, is these had a reputation for bulletproof reliability. They were just known to go on and on and on. A couple of things to note in around the front of the car. First of all, headlight wipers. Oh, we love a headlight wiper, don't we? I need a, a t-shirt with a headlight wiper on it because that would be my new favourite t-shirt. We've got ABS. ABS in well, 1992, towards the end of the run, that was fairly you know, standard item on a luxury executive car like this. But early on when this car came out in 1984, uh, ABS was very much a, a luxury item. My W123 from 83 has got ABS, but that was an insanely expensive option back at the time when that car was built. The battery's in the traditional Mercedes position up by the bulkhead, I guess for good weight distribution and keeps it away from any accident damage. Uh, we go at the VIN number over here and there is a really good resource. Mercedes are so thorough and detailed in their history keeping. Uh, using a website called mbdata.com, I believe, we can actually enter this uh, VIN number and we can see exactly how this car left the factory. Should we do that? 
Right, our fact it's called laughvin.com, it seems to have changed its name. Uh, the old database website seems to be uh, available for sale now if you want it. Uh, the first three numbers you'll find are 124, which tells you the chassis code of the car. Then beyond that, I can tell you, this is a 103940 Space 22 engine with a 722-429-03 transmission, which I think is a five-speed auto. Ordered in the UK, grey cloth interior, brilliant silver metallic colour code 744U, approximate build date January 1992. Now we've got uh, leather steering wheel, additional blinker lamps, which I think uh, side repeaters, yes they are down there. Right hand vehicles as per EC regulations, electric sliding sunroof with tilting device, automatic transmission, four gear, it's a four speed, not a five speed, that's interesting. Headrests in the rear, instrument with miles, paintwork preservation, folding front armrest. Uh, air conditioner and electric window regulators front and rear, uh, heat insulating glass all round, heated rear window, headlamp washers wipers, catalytic converter, eight hole alloy rims, ah, 20 litres of fuel, that came with the car as standard. Well that's interesting, learned a few bits and pieces already. So yeah, if you've got a Mercedes, check out your VIN code it says. Even 30 years later, these cars have got a reputation for solidity and build quality. It's very hard earned and very well deserved. These cars are just absolute rocks of vehicles. Uh, looking around, you can see elements of the W123, but the whole thing does look much more modern and, uh, well, part of the late 20th century rather than the mid 20th century, really. As this is kind of in keeping with the Mercedes ethos and the time, this is more austere luxury rather than out and out opulence, as you would find in a more modern E-Class. Uh, so we've got wooden inserts and basic fabric rather than leather and lights everywhere. Starting with the door card, now the door is, doesn't feel too heavy, it's kind of hinged in such a way that there's only certain points in, in its range we think, yes, that's going some, and then you pull it and it just clunks shut. Wow, what a thump, that feels, it feels like quality. The door card is a combination of hard wearing, a vinyl -y plastic at the top, the same grey cloth as the seats in the middle, and at the bottom the doors are carpeted like a, a felty velour, which I guess is fairly hard wearing because the car's been around for 28 years and uh, it look, doesn't look particularly worn at all. Uh, um, there aren't many controls or embellishments in the door, it's a fairly plain place, it's just the, the pattern of the fabric and this nice wood, same as you find over here in the dashboard, I believe it's called Zebrano. I think it's a metal backed uh, wood veneer with a bit of varnish on the top. It looks nice and actually almost kind of glows with the colour, it's very attractive. Um, we've just got manual, we've got a manual adjuster for the driver's door mirror. There is an electric adjuster down here for the passenger door, which is sort of sensible, but it seems a bit, bit cheap skating on a car as expensive as this. Uh, solid, hard-wearing metal door pull, that's never going to break. And down the bottom, we've got a fairly narrow but quite deep door pocket, which again, as I covered with the, uh, the felty stuff. Then moving on to the dashboard, this is a absolute fail of a tee shelf. It's a, not too far an area away from you, but it's all on a slope. It's like a minor ski ramp, so you can have play play Lego cars or Hot Wheels would be brilliant on this actually, because you can see we've got the best Hot Wheels. Who, who could make a jump here from the top of the dashboard to the uh, armrest in the middle? That would be quite impressive if you could do that. I'm, I'm going to say some kind of dragster would do that better than a van. Better aerodynamics. On top of it, we've also got our front speakers. They are in the top corners of the dashboard here. Same with the W123. And then we've got the instruments, which I'm not going to say are a direct lift of the 123's instruments, but if they're not, they've done very little work. They definitely took that Tuesday afternoon off after they did the instruments um, on this one, because they are so massively close. The oil pressure, the temperature, fuel in one pod, speedo in the middle looks the same and of course the rev counter and clock on the right hand side. I would actually be genuinely surprised if these are different instruments in a slightly different fascia. And of course below that we've got all our standard warning lights. And the bottom of this butts up to like a flat line across the width of the car with four fairly rectangular air vents, two in the middle, one either side and that's all in this hard dark blue grey plastic vinyl stuff which is then undercut or lined underneath with more of this nice Zebrano wood which goes full width of the car just here, just a little gap for the steering column and down into the centre console. Looks really, really nice. And this centre console, again, is borrowed heavily from the 123, the design language, I would say, rather than actual components. Although these switches and things, I'm gonna say, again, if they took Tuesday afternoon off after finishing the uh, instruments early, they took Wednesday afternoon off after finishing these buttons early. Then we've got the single column. It's not a column shift, so other, that would be two columns, uh, but indicators, wipers, everything is all on this one stalk on the right hand side. They've got the steering wheel, leather wrapped as it said in the VIN decoder, and the horn. Let's have a quick horn test. 
maximum road clearing ability. This one doesn't have the town and country horn, but it's still quite blasty. We're like a blasty horn. This is a big steering wheel, but then dropping down below that into the full wheel, only two pedals, it's an automatic, but ha ha, there is a third pedal. Why? Because it's old Mercedes foot brake, ugh, which has got a pull release down there underneath the light switch. This is all basically exactly the same layout as you'll find up until certainly W210, I think a 211 as well. It's certainly into the last 10 years or so. It's only now they've uh, started doing electric handbrakes. This arrangement has, uh, has disappeared. Also worth noting, this car has got old genuine Mercedes floor mats, over mats. So the carpet is pristine underneath. This car has actually got 94 and a half thousand miles on it, but it really doesn't look it. Then moving into the center console, lots of Zebrano wood, and we've got different layers, levels almost. Uh, the top one has got a few minor controls. We've got the heated rear window, interior light, hazard warning lights, and the button for the fold down headrests, which I haven't quite worked out how you use them. I think they pop up when there's someone sat in the back seat and then you push that button to wind it down again so you can see out the back. Very clever. Now the next level down, we've got our heating and ventilation. And this is notable for a car of this age for two reasons. First of all, dual zone, two windy winder wheels for the driver and the passenger to control their own heating and ventilation temperature, which is nice and pretty uncommon in 1993. But also, as we just saw from the VIN decoder, air conditioning, wow. This was an expensive car, so if you're gonna find it anywhere, it's gonna be here, but still, wow, what a luxury to have. That is something that puts a lot of people off running a classic or a retro car as a daily, the fact you don't get air con, and if it's hot in the summertime, misting up in the winter time, not a problem with this one. The moving down from that rather exciting find to another rather exciting find, the original Mercedes classic uh, radio cassette uh, with a very wide, almost full width LCD screen because this is early 90s, so we're into the decade of well, technology by the time this one came out. And underneath that, tap the, uh, the wood veneer and out folds, very softly damped, the uh, ashtray with lots of chrome embellishment and a feeling of kind of quality on the, on the lighter itself, which looks like it's never been used, which is always a good thing to find in a car. So your 12 volt is hiding in there. This rolls down into the center console for the automatic gearbox, four speed as we've just discovered. Shift to P when parking the car. Yeah, people just never used to use the handbrake or the park brake on autos. I don't know if they still do avoid that. Then we've got four electric windows as we just found out in the VIN code and the controller for the left hand mirror. And then finally, 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 in the middle, we've got a little carpeted uh, oddment tray. Again, the same as the W123. That was this car's direct predecessor and they've carried over so many items of that car's design and, uh, and functionality. And of course we do have this armrest in the center, big and padded and solid. Th these things confuse people quite a lot uh, because on this and the 123, they lock in the vertical position. You have to push the big button nearest the driver. In fact, the entire end of it is a button and then you can fold it back down again. Finally, 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 we've got the glove box, but lockable of course. And inside there, we have our two cup holders. So this is our minimal amount of T-shelfery going on here. More finallys, I forgot to mention electric tilt slide sunroof. We knew about it from the, uh, the thing in there. That's a full metal panel, which slides back and flashing away in front of it in the style of a Volvo. Because I'm sat here without my seatbelt on, I've got a warning light, like being on a, on a commercial airliner. Uh, red light flashing, insert seatbelt tab, insert seatbelt tab. Seats must be vertical, trays must be reclined, or whatever you do with trays. Ah, right, okay, now we'll look in the back. Oh, sorry, one more thing. One more thing, I just discovered this thing. This is actually <laughs> a bit of genius. Because you've got your sun visor here, and your sun visor here. But you must have had this thing where both sun visors are down, but you're driving at just such an angle that the sun is peeping between the top of the windscreen and the, uh, and the rear view mirror, and it's just dazzling you, and you just want to sort of drive like that. Not a problem in this car. You've got a middle sun visor. Wow, that's genius. Those guys think of everything. Well, the back of the car is actually surprisingly tight. For a car designed at the, well, it's got two real markets in the, around the world. First of all, the executive market, the self-drive executive market, some of the BMW 5 Series and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's a, not, exp no. so you wouldn't necessarily have a uh, owner being chauffeured in the back of one of these, but in Germany in particular, these were taxi cabs and this is surprisingly tight. So I'm a little bit surprised at how tight this is to actually get into in the first place and then sit here with not a lot of knee room. Although the seat is quite comfortable, there's decent headroom, kind of sink quite low into the chair. Nice armrest in the door, kind of very much the same deal as the front doors. Uh, vinyl, wood, carpet, electric window, and a big old ashtray down the bottom. And felty, velour-y map pockets on the back of the seats. We do also have a big armrest. Oh, 
padded, nice, comfy. And then in the parcel shelf in the back, we've got three things. First of all, we've got rear speakers, same as in the front, they're not in the doors, they're up in the, uh, in the shelf. Uh, then in the middle, we've got our first aid kit, it's still here after all these years, never been used, which is a good thing. And finally, we've got these fold up headrests. Default position is down, so you can see out the back of the car, but I haven't quite figured out how they work. I need to go and read the handbook. Wow, this is a bit of a cavern. You could seriously uh, dispose of a couple of bodies in there quite happily. Uh, it goes on all the way back here. The seats don't fold down, but there's room enough for a couple of big suitcases or black plastic bags that are tied off at the top with gaffer tape. Also, we've got quite deep kind of side pockets that dip right down there. And underneath the carpet in the center, whoops, we do have a large plastic area which hides a full-size spare wheel and the jack. It's all in there. And of course, being a practical German car, we've got a fire extinguisher on the left. We've got a hazard warning triangle up in the boot lid. So a bit of warmth on this car. Dies. Classic old school automatic wafting, a bit of bit of acceleration, the engine revs build, nothing really happens and it kind of drifts forward and a little kind of thump into second as you pull away. Must adjust that left hand mirror. Curious thing with these cars, the left hand passenger mirror is a totally different size to the right hand driver's mirror. So that's kind of a little small square thing on the, on the left and a narrow oblongy thing on the right. Very curious. This does ride like a comfortable executive car. It doesn't feel rapid. I've drifted up to 40. It's a 50 limit down here. Uh, it felt kind of like I was going fast, really. Not, not fast fast, but it felt like I'd acquired speed. The ride is very, very smooth on this. There's no compromise in terms of comfort on this car whatsoever. This was one of those cars where they just pushed the boundaries and research, development, safety, design, everything was just pushed further forward just to make it a better car than before. And so it's got independent front suspension with McPherson struts. At the back, it's got the same uh, multi-link rear that was used in the W201 or the 190, which has not long been out and gives it a really controlled, planted ride, as well as plenty of comfort. And it was a design they used for a long time in later cars. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rotom in Kent. If you want to check out this car and others, the really quite interesting stuff they've got in stock, hit the link in the description below. Wow, they've got sunglasses now. It's actually got nice. Who knew? This is definitely a sunglasses car. This is a, a sunglasses coolness car. You can cruise in this thing. So yes, I was saying, uh, excellent platform, which they put to good use. There are lots of different options of ways you can buy this car. Obviously there's the saloon, which we're sat in right now. There was a two door coupe. There was a big five door, the T, uh, which had a few other innovations on it as well. For example, uh, there was the silent closed neighbor friendly boot lid, where you pushed it almost all the way down and it sucked itself in the last little centimeter or two so that it would, uh, closed quietly and also more tightly, meaning there was uh, no wind noise coming into the cabin, which is a bit of a bane of some estate vehicles, station wagons. And then from 1989, they brought out the convertible, a little bit wobbly, but certainly very classy as soft tops go. And then it gets interesting because uh, they knew their market and there was a big market for ambulances, hearses, commercials, basically. So you could buy it as a rolling chassis, just like the front, front end bodywork and the engine and transmission, just this bit really, and a, a bare chassis at the back. So you could have that as a regular or long wheelbase and then build your own car on top of it. Even under full acceleration, it's wafty at best. It's not a car you can hustle in at all. This is very much the economy version, the E for Eco, I guess you might, might say. So it wafts along, it's comfortable, it's relaxing. In some ways, it's kind of like my Volvo, but uh, a slightly different take on the same thing. A big barge, not much power, comfy seats, and indestructible. I have heard it described as a Volvo 700 or 900 as a gateway drug to big old Mercedes estates. And that's probably a fair assessment. 
In my case, Volvo 740 is a gateway drug to a car I already wanted, a Ford Crown Victoria, which is nothing like this. Well, extremely tough, but the interior is not as nice. And this is quite incredible. This uh, wood, the plastic, the trim, everything is just rock solid. Nothing feels like it's ever going to rattle. The only rattle in the car right now is coming from my camera mount. It's just quite cool. When a car like this with that great big star down the far end of the bonnet, which I actually kind of missed. I've got a W210, but it's the AMG Sport version. So that C-Class has not got the star on the bonnet. And I actually kind of missed that because looking down here now, I can see the trees kind of flowing up the bonnet in their reflection. And the star is just sitting there glistening in the sunlight. That's actually quite a magical thing. I'll be honest, with my W123, that is something I'm really looking forward to experiencing. Now, I mentioned earlier there were lots of uh, engine options you could get in one of these. There were also various transmission options. There was a five-speed auto, I believe. There was a manual option. Uh, I, on W123, they had the choice of automatic on the, in the centre on the floor or up on the column. Now, incredibly, on these cars, you could even get Formatic four-wheel drive. I don't think it was ever sold in the UK, but that kind of thing, and certainly in mountainous parts of Europe, was a pretty common and popular choice. This is not a car you're ever going to win a drag race in, but you can just arrive anywhere you go relaxed, feeling like you're in command. I have just been sprayed with yucky stuff off that truck in front, which does mean I do get to experience that amazing wiper. That is something amazing. It's like it's writing a letter B across the, uh, the windscreen and a, like a big capital B on its side with that clever little canted mechanism. Quite an innovative bit of design. So it's one wiper, but you've got virtually no unswept area in either corner and no need to change the mechanism for left or right hand drive. This isn't really the kind of car you'd go for a 0 to 60 in, because you run out of road. And it's also not very dignified, but uh, <laughs> it's just so comfortable, so wafty. If you wanted a daily retro classic kind of car to just enjoy on a daily basis, you, you could use this quite happily. The thing with these is they were so well built and so common that for a long time it was hard to see them as a classic car because they were just so good. They were kind of everywhere. About 10 years ago, you could pick them up for a grand, grand and a half for really nice, really good, shiny, rust-free, fairly low mileage estate and just you use it and use it. But time, rust, uh, MOT guys who are not willing to let them through with quite that many defects have thinned the herd quite significantly and they really aren't around as much as they used to be. And suddenly people have appreciated, well, people always did appreciate them, but now it's hard to find one to, to acquire and appreciate without it being more of a cosseted classic. They do still come up if you sort of search Auto Trader and Marketplace, you'll find one that maybe some guy bought new back in 1990 and he's had it on his drive ever since and perhaps giving up driving now. But more and more, they do tend to be in the, uh, the classic network which in a way is good because they will now be preserved rather than just used to death. But if you were looking for a car to just use sort of lightly on a day-to-day -day basis as a classic daily, you'd do a lot worse than one of these. In fact, almost everything you could choose would be worse than one of these. This is just so nice to waft in. Oh. I do hope my W123 is half as nice as this is when it finally gets on the road. Now, if I was specking one of these for my own use, I think I would probably want the 280, so it's got a little bit more poke. As always, I would go for the manual because I'm no fan of an automatic in really anything. But I also would quite like the estate version. Yeah, 280 TE manual. That would be my dream perfect W124. I could be happy with that. I could daily that pretty much forever. However, as I do seem to have a habit of buying quite nice saloon cars, really, I don't know, my Volvo, my W123, my Rover P6s, this wouldn't be out of place on my drive at all. Well, thank you for joining me today on this ride out in this car. It is really quite interesting. It's a development of a car which I own, but have yet to physically drive more than a few feet up and down the driveway. Uh, so yes, yeah, it's quite interesting. 
It's uh, not fast. It is comfortable. There's a lot of luxury bits going on there in a late 80s, early 90s kind of way. And it just feels like it's the most solid car I've ever been in. I'm, I'm kind of taken with it. It's not fast, but it is comfy. So there you go. Hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please hit the like and subscribe buttons as always. And uh, hit that little bell notification thing down there for seeing next times. And I'll see you next time driving something completely different.